Um, I think that I'll go ahead and start. It looks like we can just let people come in as they as as we go. Um, hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm Margaret. I work at Printed Matter. I'm the operations manager here. Um, we're really excited to have Franny and Charlotte here. Um, I just want to make a few notes before we begin that we will be recording this conversation um, and making it available at a later time. And then also that we will have um, a live transcript service for anyone who needs it. Um, and so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Light Journal was published on December 21st, 2020, the winter solstice designed by Charlotte Taillé and written by Francesca Capone. It was published with the support of Nationale, a gallery in Portland, Oregon. Light Journal is a conceptual writing project where daily perceptions of light have been recorded as notes on a smartphone, a source of light unto itself. Similar to the process of weaving on a loom, the book starts at a point in time and builds upwards towards the present. It forms a long and colorful tapestry of text and time and a soft coping meditation and response to the difficult climate we are living through. Accompanying the book are a series of concrete poems, sunflower seeds, a piece of turmeric dyed canvas, a glow in the dark star, and a postcard print of a neon weaving. Today, they will navigate across an explorative research of the various forms in which the sun and light appear as focal points. From a record of the light as a journal, it expands to spiral sun petroglyph, neon light, windows to the sky, sundials, sun dance, pa paintings and maps of the stars, turmeric dye, sunflowers folklore, even synthetic light absorbing plastic. So take it away. <laughs> hey, um, so um, our first slide is the publication. So you can see everything that's in it. And our second slide is the project where, for which we met, which is called uh, Woven Places. And that was published in 2018. Um, and for that project, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, start, we, complete, we didn't know each other and we got put together to do that amazing book with without never meeting each other in real life. So we kind of trained, like we kind of discovered that we could collaborate um, through the internet and through just calling each other and exchanging PDFs or images. And um, yeah. So, so this was, is this was a book that was, we, this is Charlotte Taillet and I'm Francesca Capone. <laughs> we didn't introduce ourselves. Um, but oh yeah, Woven Places is how we met in 2018. <clears throat> it was published by some other books in New York and actually launched in real life at the New York Art Book Fair in the fall of 2018, which seems like uh, centuries ago now. Um, and it was an inquiry into a sense of place through location-based weavings, photos, and ephemera. So this was our first project together. And like Charlotte said, we got accustomed to working uh, over FaceTime and WhatsApp um, between Portland and London and uh, managing, collaborating through the time difference. Um, so we began this second project um, just at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, so we would just like check on WhatsApp and just being friends and just kind of like also being interested in what would happen on such far away places. And yeah, we were just experimenting the same kind of isolation and need for making a new project, but at the same time, didn't want to like force it. So it was a kind of special, like, yeah, we just kind of reconnected around uh, COVID, but then also looking for some kind of inspirational um, content out of each other. Um, we began discussing Light Journal as I was uh, had just started writing it and was thinking about the design of it. Um, and more so, we just explored the idea together. So what exactly is light? How do we perceive it? How does it appear in the lives of people and the marks or movements that they make on the world? Um, and it occurred to me that when Charlotte and I, so this uh, presentation that we'll, we'll show you is like, a document that we passed back and forth and sort of added research to. And as we were kind of polishing it up for this um, 
to share with you all, I realized that actually because of our positions on the earth, Charlotte and I pass the sun back and forth, just as we've passed ideas back and forth. So my day is her night and vice versa. So Charlotte will work on something during the day and then pass to me. And, um, and when she's sleeping, I'll be working on the same thing. So that was kind of a lovely idea that we uh, realized. Yeah. Um, so this is the beginning of Francesca's inspiration, which is your <laughs> so this, uh, the practice of creating light journal was in tandem of making um, weavings out of LED and neon, um, which typical of my practice, I'll work in the woven form and in the written form sort of simultaneously. And when I um, started meeting with Charlotte about the possibility of transforming the journal into a book, I shifted from seeking light out in my visual environment. So was seeking light out uh, to record the book and then also in uh, the creation of these weavings um, to seeking uh, out light in research and then seeking out Charlotte's light, her actual intellectual light bulb, um, which interests me so much and brought so much joy to, and discovery to the project. Um, so the light expanded from uh, the work that I was doing sort of uh, in my personal practice to being seen in my friend and collaborator. Um. This is a collection of our kind of glossary of books. Um, so she, Francesca, brought me her text in like kind of a, not a raw form, but it was, you know, was kind of fresh out of her um, phone and out of what she just wrote without being edited or anything. And it just became this shared resource that was so grounding for where are we gonna go with that? Um, and we we both began to look into the history of light and what it can be entail for in relation to the text. So, because it's such a it's such an enormous and so vague uh, concept, light and sun is just it kind of go in every direction. And her poems were very very like were a way to kind of centralize. Uh, what like if you just look at your library you just see everything can be about sun and can be about light or like there's always something that can pull you out in a direction and uh, so this is the kind of this is where we kind of started it's I think just typical for both of our practices to start with books o often for me my, my writing practice even starts with uh, pulling from existing books and I think Charlotte being graphic designer, of course, that's a huge point of reference. So um, this is only a, a few things, but really like a whole library formed of sort of books in relation to light uh, as we started collaborating on the project. Yeah, and there were like the selection was not necessarily about the design, um, but more about how it's translated, how light can be interpreted, like how what people are doing with that. Um, so part one is the journal. Um, so this is a text that I shared with Charlotte at the very beginning of the pandemic uh, to, context to contextualize why I began writing the light journal. Um, at first the journal was influenced by the climate, like the actual weather of where I live in the Pacific Northwest where the sun goes away for six months of the year. Uh, and then I had actually began light journaling since October. So just at the very beginning of technically what's Portland winter. So it's like six months, the lights are on and then six months starting in October, the lights basically go off and it's cloudy all the time. Uh, and it became increasingly important for me as a regular practice of meditation as the political and environmental climate started escalating in 2020 and the state of emergency in the world felt more extreme. Um, so this was keep in mind like the beginning of the pandemic uh, intense social un unrest in the world, um, in America, and particularly in, in Portland, the Oregon fires and, and weeks of smoke. So just was obviously, we all lived through 2020, intense year and uh, the practice of grounding in the here and now by ob observing light became really critical for um, my personal sense of well-being. So it was a really grounding, important practice for me. Um, the, then the next slide is here and now, but the origin 
um, so yeah, the, the here and now from the last slide was influenced by considering the here and now. Um, I was through Zen Buddhist philosophy, which I was doing a, some research into, just thinking about how to be present when there's um, so much external forces. Uh, so I found this, this passage about the here and now. Um, and at, the, at that moment, I was absorbing the stresses of the external realities of being in America, uh, as we all have been. And it was so easy to fall into a state of panic, to be everywhere but here. And the sensory focus of meditating on light, the constant patterns and repetitions of the cosmos were incredibly grounding. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I was reading this text again today, and I was just thinking how it's not that easy, actually, to be in the here and now. It's, it's a real, you really need to pull yourself out of your situation and just kind of try and enjoy what's happening in the present mm -hmm. because there's so many external things coming at you all the time and you just even if it's even if it's just in your house everything is kind of constantly coming and going and yeah this it just made me think how I need to do it more like <laughs> how how mm, yeah I so said it was actually very difficult. It sounds kind of easy when we're like thinking about like, oh yeah, we're just here and it's just the present, but to actually be um, part of it is actually difficult. Sure. Um, next slide. Um, so I realized today actually that both of these paintings are paintings I saw at the Guggenheim in, in New York. Um, but yes, my, my research started with seeking understanding for how to be present through Zen Buddhist philosophy, uh, where I found that passage. And then um, I, was, I was pulling from a handful of artists whose work I often reference and seek learning in. And so Zen Buddhism then led me to Agnes Martin, who used this philosophy to explore the landscapes around her. Many of her paintings, of course, were influenced by the qualities of light in New Mexico and uh, just recognizing that the quality of light in the, I think there's a lot of West Coast artists who have, have explored light, uh, but the light in the Southwest uh, is very different from the light in the Northwest. So uh, really my explosion into light was due to an absence of light. Um, and so seeking it out because it wasn't there. Um, and, and Agnes Martin has her own philosophies, of course, this particular quote, uh, what we make is what we feel particularly resonated. Um, and I was also drawn to Hilma F. Clint, whose spiritual connection to the cosmos inspired her monumental series of paintings, which often depict planets and the symbolic balance of light and dark. I actually just remembered, I saw her show in Berlin. Mm. I completely forgot, just remember, <laughs> so weird, anyway. It's really, yeah, it's such an, she's such an amazing and like in completely mysterious painter as well. Very mysterious. Um, next slide is our kind of central reference. Or like for me, I felt like it was a very central reference in our like, when we just kind of went over all of the different artists that we, we were pulling out from. Yeah. Um. So the, the observation of, in Clint's work of the cosmos uh, made me think of Bucky or Buckminster Fuller, who, who's uh, an artist I or a scientist philosopher um, who, who I often refer to in my research. And this text is on his foundation's website. I assume it's from the 60s or 70s. Um, but the contextualization of a person uh, in relation to the cosmos, that being that we're very small, uh, and even our sun is comparatively diminutive to that of other galaxies. Um, so it means that there's like bigger light and bigger suns out there, which is kind of mind blowing. And further in relationship to humanity's unprecedented acceleration of communication and information. So this is like a text that is old, but so prescient um, because both ideas felt very relevant as two focal points in, in my experience uh, for today. So one is meditating on the light and the cosmos as a vast form of escape while in isolation. So you may be in isolation in your home, but you can still see the sky and it can be this way to both be present and escape. Mm -hmm. um, and the other on Zoom and, and FaceTime, which uh, brings us all outside of isolation in other ways and in relationship to our community. So just 
Uh, of course, uh, Bucky, you know, seeing the future always. Um, but yeah, I agree, Charlotte, this text is really important. Next slide is about Robert Ewing. So thinking about perception, um, that the perception that Bucky relates, and then reminded me of Irwin, whose work I was looking at while developing the LEDs uh, woven pieces. And this quote came up for me quite a bit while writing the journal, uh, just being frequently amazed by the concept that the world of shape and color ceases to exist without light to illuminate it or without the eye's um, ability to perceive it. So just this idea that um, when your eyes are closed, nothing is there, but also if nothing, if this sun is not touching anything, you also can't see it. So it's almost like there's nothing without sunlight and everything is touched by light in some way in order to exist. Next slide is um, James to head. Um, so, I mean, also, I think like you can see visually that like this idea of the circle becomes, of course, a central theme uh, in, the, in the artworks that are being influenced and, and the colors, of course, of, of blue and yellow become apparent, I think. Um, but yes, Rob, uh, James Terrell. So James Terrell, Terrell's work is, of course, critical when researching the perception of light and light as a medium. Um, and this idea of not seeing light, but rather what light reveals and the importance of tuning in at the transitions of light. So at sunrise and sunset, and actually in Portland, even when it's like pissing rain all day long and uh, you don't see the sun for days, typically it does briefly appear at sunrise and sunset. I don't know what it is about the climate here that, that permits that, but um, that I just uh, think that idea of tuning in at transi transitions of light is really brilliant and, and when it's kind of most interesting. Um, so these were both fundamental ideas that appear in the text of Light Journal and typically like in the book there's um, events, uh, which is really su basically subtleties of light that um, where something appears to be kind of like happening and um, a lot oftentimes that happened at transitions. So this felt very much present uh, in the practice of recording light in the journal. Our next slide is Roland Barth, which we updated just today with those amazing pictures. <laughs> yeah, so this is a text um, which Charlotte informed me was published posthumously. And I often reference the work of Barthes and um, discovered this portion in an essay of his book, Incidents, where he recognizes light as an actor and also a medium for art. Um, and this was at this nightclub called uh, Les Palaces, where there's this neon sculpture, but um, Actually, this became um, apparent to us just recently. I, I thought that it was in reference to like spotlights, but it was really more about neon sculpture, which is amazing um, and, yeah. and such a wonderful poeticism that um, Charlotte actually pulled these images up recently. Um, but I guess what resonated with me about this text is just that he recognizes light as an actor and a character. And this is something that actually occurred naturally to me as I was writing. Um, light journal, but focusing on the movement and the presence of light, the moon in particular, becomes a character in, in my life and therefore a character in the book as I'm perceiving it. So it would appear on the floor in my living room um, or in the bathroom or at the foot of my bed, all of which are documented. And it was always felt very dramatic, like the moon was present with me. And of course, <laughs> you know, I'm, as we can all relate, I was like relatively alone most of the time in isolation. So the presence of the moon became an even stronger realization and character when it would show up uh, in the room with me. But yeah, we love this image of uh, Barton in the, night, in the nightclub. <laughs> yeah, they're really amazing. Yeah. A cool, what a cool nightclub. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so that's the last slide of the part one. Which yes. Is about Susan. So Susan Tick is a New York artist and designer working mostly in weaving and she's a big inspiration to me. Um, and this work came up when I was starting to weave with LED and neon and was curious if it had ever been done before. And of course it had been done by Susan Tick um, in 2014 and in 2019, I think at Art Basel. Um, and just thinking about the way the light moves through her pieces 
though they're quite static, um, that was particularly interesting to me. So this idea that light is always in movement, actually, even when it appears to be still. So think of the slow rotation of the sun through the sky, the pulsing of neon through a tube, uh, the vibration of a light bulb, et cetera. It's almost like you really have to tune in to see it, its movement, but, but it's always there. Mm -hmm. um, and then our conclusion for part one, which is, um, it's the only part that has a conclusion. Um, <laughs> but we felt like, because this first part is um, kind of unfolding of Francesca's um, references and inspiration, um, it kind of came together because, so this conclusion is about color and her inspiration in color, but the whole, each poem is very much about colors and the sun um, in relation to light and what it creates and what it reflects. So we felt like this needed to be a little bit about. Um, so, yeah. So yes, um, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I wanted to be clear because it's kind of weird to have a conclusions like in the middle. Um, so yes, so I tell Adnan. Um, so the color of the sun, as Charlotte mentions, is an evolving theme in the book. Um, and the color of the sun varies, of course, throughout the day. And uh, in Oregon becomes red during fire season. So in Atel Adnan's paintings of Mount Tam, the sun often shows up in a different color or sometimes shape um, and is always present. And this painting in the middle is here in Portland in a private collection that I love to visit that's called the Lumber Room. Um, and the sun in this painting is pale, is red on a pale yellow sky and feels very connected to the um, atmosphere that was here in Portland in, in August of 2020, uh, where the sky was like enveloped in smoke, but still the sun came through as this like red color and the sky was almost yellow. It looks identical to it. Um, do you want the next slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, so this text I discovered um, at Bourgeois show at, at MoMA in New York. Um, and there are portions of the book in Light Journal that take place in New York because it's my home and I often visit. Um, and it's amazing to me revisiting this text as we were kind of doing the, the research um, because the skies that she describe in the book are, ex or in this text are exactly like the skies that I describe in the book. Um, so this like utterly blue and glorying white uh, that Bourgeois references is, is very much um, mirrored in the passages uh, in Light Journal that, that speak about the skies in New York. Mm -hmm. And also, sorry, one more thing, okay. the way that she compares the light to Paris and she kind of like, it seems like a little bit resents Paris actually definitely resonated with me as well. Just thinking about being in Portland and the, the quality of light versus, which is of course very different in the summer, but um, versus the sky in, in New York. So for me, I had a different parallel of comparison, but still uh, resonated in the, in the, almost like resentment <laughs> of Paris and in my case, Oregon. Oh, yeah, pardon. I guess it's also the thing of like, maybe the sky is the same everywhere, but actually it's so different. It's so completely different and you don't, you're not in the same light scheme or color scheme, or color scheme if you're in Portland or Paris or New York. And totally. it does completely change the atmosphere of the place. Yes, and actually in the book too, um, I was doing a lot of traveling for work for my uh, materials design work and was in Seoul and in, um, and in, in China and like described the qualities of light in those places too, which is super different. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Um, so these are a few photos and, and a text, like a text that as I was exploring, um, the idea of light and th there were, these are a few photos that I took on the Oregon coast actually about a year ago today. Um, and it was a very clear day. So this is at sunrise and at sunset and was just considering the sun and its capacity to create color and even on objects so vast such as the sea and the sky and also shadows and even the moon. 
So just thinking that sun is the creator of all of these um, phenomenon and the, and the way that they appear. Um, so it's definitely a heightened state of awareness to look around and notice that everything is actually made of sunlight, um, even dark things. So that I think, um, yeah, just continues to uh, inspire me. Mm -hmm. okay. Like even night is <laughs> where Charlotte is right now, even night is made of sunlight because it's um, the absence of sunlight in a way. Yeah, so boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like, yeah, it's very dark here, very, very early. So it does feel very nice to look at your pictures of beautiful sunset. Um, Completely cloudy here today. So. Um, part two is called The Sun as Architecture. Um, so this slide is Oh, like this, I guess this part is where our research shifted and we started to experience the sun by going outside on walks or through the window of our room or on the balcony or in a garden or on the way to the supermarket when lockdown kind of took place and it kind of the state of like emergency became way more present and going out was not really an option. And uh, sunlight became a real source of energy or like a resource, something that we would kind of grab a bit from every day and go home and kind of try and use very, very slowly. Um, and it also, I mean, it just made me reflect a lot on time, on the, on the impact of the sun on time and space and ruling out days outside of working hour by, yeah, is there going on a walk very early in the morning? or at lunchtime, because in the evening, obviously, if there is no sun, where would we go out? Um, and then, yeah, this practical perception of light is very universal to all cultures throughout history. And I found a lot of, and my, a lot of my answers and more question in um, this back and forth in time uh, from looking at Le Corbusier Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. Um, and I went to, this is a picture of me visiting it few years ago um, and looking at the sketches that Francesca brought in we kind of can connected on this idea of distributing light throughout the day and how it will come in our living space. Um, this book so my dad is an architect and has an amazing library and I found these sketches in an old Corbu book um, and it, it definitely made me think about how, you know, what I was mentioning before, it was like the moon and the sun as characters in the book and that kind of enter into an architectural space and um, just loved how that was sort of designed into uh, Corbu's philosophy that, okay, this is how the sun enters into the space and this is how the sun is distributed through space. Um, yeah. Um, next slide. So from Le Corbusier talking about that with Francesca, I just kind of clicked on this place called Mesa Verde, which is a place that I really wanted to visit a few years ago when I went to America, um, but it was not on the parkour, too, was kind of too far from the wood. Um, but I really look at it as a place where they've kind of managed something with the sun that is, um, is very, it's, it's just kind of above interesting. It's just like very, yeah, it's very special. So it's in, um, it's an ancestral Puebland village in New Mexico, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and it's built on this cliff cave. So it's inside a kind of hook in the, in the rock and it's using the sun passively. So it's kind of distributing light on each level and it's, um, it's kind of the way we will use the sun for a greenhouse. So you don't need to heat it with like an electric heater. It's just kind of distribute the light and then the warmth and it's controlling it as well. So that throughout the year, you have the same amount of light in every, for every household. Um, yeah, so that in connection to Le Corbusier is kind of made who came first, but obviously that came first. Um. 
So I actually visited this place when I was a child with my family. I feel very grateful for that experience. Um, and I'm like continually blown away just by how equitable and humane this philosophy is or this um, kind of concept is and how it reveres light as this, I mean, of course it's <clears throat> functional for heat and also if you don't have electricity, um, but I love just how, um, how humane it is and how it sort of equally equitably, equitably gives everybody the same privilege. And it just felt like the total opposite of uh, capitalist society and most architecture built within that system. And I just love here that no, no one can block light from another person or sort of take light away um, from somebody else. It's, it's equitably distributed throughout the, the society. So I just think it's brilliant. Yeah, so like, I mean, during lockdown, it was so apparent that some people have horrible places of living and have just no access to light and they cannot rest in the light, they cannot go outside. So obviously, you just keep on hearing the story of like this person with an enormous house in like wherever <laughs> and like five people living in one room and having to kind of suffer together. And it's just, it's just, it made like this, um, place was so inspiring for us and um, yeah just very it kind of pushed a little bit further the door into that part of the research. Um, the next slide is a bit more messy <laughs> but um, so through making my way in Google map landscape around because I was so I was looking at Mesa Verde and I was just kind of looking at the landscape walking around uh, with Google Map, uh, I came across the temple, which is very near. And um, this building is a um, religious matter. It's not obviously because it's very old. It's not, you know, we don't have an exact book of rules of what was happening there, but it's obviously a temple. And uh, it's be using to celebrate the sun and then the solstice and the cycle around what the sun creates um, and it's, yeah, it's for spiritual activities and it's there to feed the sun and enhance its light and just kind of obviously I came I thought about Stonehenge because I visited it on my 30th birthday which was not so far away and um, yeah Stonehenge is a place where it's just perfectly aligned for the sun to cross on either winter or summer solstice. And then just, you know, kind of applies to any time and time in like religion that there is always, always someone representing the sun or always a sun temple. Um, I don't remember the name now, but the Tibetan have a temple and yet yeah, Egyptian, Egyptian of the sun Ra and Everywhere you kind of look at, there's always something about how to celebrate this power or this warmth. Um, yeah. Should I, do you want to say something? No, go ahead, Chad. Um, next slide is the living space. So we're kind of coming back from the religious matter to a more um, scientific matter. Um, so Buckminster Fuller has been, as I said earlier, quite regularly coming back in our conversation. And um, yeah, he kind of allowed us to make this bridge between thinking about the sun and it's kind of magic and what it creates and also what scientifically we are engaging with it. Um, and also just being able to live in a space that doesn't feel claustrophobic with um, a more welcoming light that is not just like in our dream, but also can be like, I feel like, I felt like he gave a lot of proposal on how to make our living space so much more welcoming for light while being indoor and uh, the geodesic, geodesic dome is one of the kind of living space that felt the most accurate for it. It's almost like um, a lot of the, or a, some of the research took the shape of 
definitely being influenced by being in isolation and being influenced by the idea that you could be in an architectural space where you're inside, uh, but able to see the passage of the sun across the arc of the sky or able to um, have the sun allow your, uh, um, the sun enter your interior space. So this idea of being in isolation influenced the research because of course, that's what we were all dealing with. Yeah, and also the fact that you can block some of the triangles and that the, those triangles can kind of create different shapes that you're not in your rectangle window, but that those blocking, like those walls can be um, more modular and more up to what the day is giving you. Yeah. Um, the part three is called the sun as symbol. So after researching uh, Mesa Verde, I came across this symbol called, called the Zaya symbol. It's used uh, by the state of New Mexico and it's both on their flag and license plate. So it's really used there. And um, so this symbol originated with the Indians of Zia Pueblo in ancient times. So it's part of the history of New Mexico. Its design reflects their tribal philosophy with its wealth of pantheistic spiritualism, teaching the basic harmonies of all time in the universe. It's the first time for me that at this point of our research, the idea of a graphic symbol that will represent the sun came, became a possibility to include as an illustration for Francesca's uh, poem because this, so this is kind of, you know, it's just a circle with some lines and words around, but it actually does make the sun meaningful and explain what are the, what is the cycle and what's the spring, like why spring, summer, fall, winter is related to infancy, youth, adult, adult, like all of those cycles are actually around the sun and just the way they translated it, it just made sense. So then it kind of appeared as, yeah, it's a graphic symbol, but it's just so revealing of what we, we are talking about as well. So not, so everything rotates around the sun uh, in the solar system, but then also like human life rotates around the sun, the, the um, seasons are determined by the sun. So just this idea of um, the circular form and uh, circular pattern are all determined by the sun. It's so powerful. Um, because it affects everything. Next slide is um, the sun died. So phases of life, cycle, rhythm, direction. Um, it kind of became like a relief for us to remember that after the summer, there is the autumn, that after the day, there is the night and that uh, everything is ongoing and that this consistent cycle is creating our calendar, that everything kind of suddenly makes sense in our daily life and that we are not just in the state of waiting, but that actually there is um, something happening here and that we are part of it. Um, so you can see here, I've put some example of uh, the Aztec calendar and the stone that is the most kind of famous um, one that is, um, Sorry, this is my line. That is used to um, predict sun cycle, uh, to predict solar eclipse. So it's not exactly known how, like how it was used, but it's for sure known that it was used to um, predict solar eclipse. So how, it's kind of a mystery a bit, but uh, you can also find them actually everywhere on the planet. You can have, yet yeah, I think there's one in Portland. Um, and you can also make your own just using a stick and YouTube and putting it in the ground and trying to kind of make a radius around and you see the time passing and you can build on your own clock and from there having a kind of calendar and knowing where you are, what time is it. Um, sun markings. So this is um, a slide about how to mark the sun passing. And we became a bit obsessed with people who are marking the sun. And we are actually part of a bigger group of 
people in time and uh, space that are marking the sun and the passage of the seasons by just drawing a spiral on um, either on the ground or obviously this is on stone. Um, and it will be um, a place that will be where the sun will pass through year after year in a perfect line uh, between rocks. And it will make this perfect line in a never changing landscape. So you kind of need condition for it. Uh, but those spirals are marker of time and space and they are symbolizing the cycle of the season. And in a way like the center of the spiral is the sun and everything that is evolving around it is the other planet or the season or whatever you want to read into. Also just this idea of a never changing landscape, I think uh, resonated with both of us being kind of um, stuck where we are um, and having the sun pass through and having it mark the spaces that we're in. Um, yeah, it's just a, um, connected to all humanity since the beginning of time, I think was just inspiring. Mm -hmm. Uh, to recognize. Next slide. So, so this is um, Bruno Minari. So this is an uh, example of someone who looked into the symbol of the sun and its eternal rotation um, and, and the forms that it takes. So he has um, this amazing series of books that are, uh, that are, you know, very pedagogical and kind of structured around doing workshops and giving classes. And so this book, um, How to Draw the Sun is something that I used. I During the pandemic, my niece and nephew were not able to go to school. So I was giving them art classes over Zoom. And while I was doing this, we, we used this, this book and we did some of the exercises in it. And it was, it was one of our favorite lessons because um, it heightened sort of together. We did drawings of shadows and um, tried to draw the sun uh, together. and it heightened our awareness of different perceptions of the sun and how it appears in art, because there's all these different renderings in the book of that. Uh, but it was also just wonderful to explore with children, their perception of the sun, their perception of the uh, shadows that the sun cast. And um, so, yeah, this book kind of came up for me in a few, few different ways. Um, this is an artwork that also actually really resonated with us. Um, talking about growing sunflower seed during lockdown, which is uh, something that Francesca did. And um, yeah, I think we just were talking about sunflower, just what they are, what they represent. And I came across this artwork by Ai Weiwei, which is um, obviously I only saw it in pictures, but it's a mountain of uncrafted porcelain seed and it's, ref it's referring to a casual snack, but also the movement of the, fl the, the flower makes every day facing the sun and for Ai Weiwei facing the leadership, um, which I thought was just such an amazing, um, as I say, early, like at the beginning of the talk, this research about the sun is very, very large and why we were pushing doors after doors and talking of every day or so about it. We just found bits that will add on to um, the book, to like the making and to our kind of conscience, oh my God, I'm never gonna say this word, to our open, I guess, open-minded way of, yeah, just making sense of it. Uh, so this is a perfect example. Like this is not something that we will have just came up with just by ourselves, and it yeah just came in. Um, so this slide is the conclusion on this part, um, and it's obviously because we started with um, we we just finished with the sunflower from Ai Weiwei. We kind of continued pushing that door, talking about the seed, and. Uh, decided to include it in the publication. We looked into what it represented and the folklore around it and the tales that the sunflower carry. And for example, in Greece, the sunflower. So we've kind of selected one tale that 
we thought it was very interesting for us. Um, so it's the story of a woman who has fallen in love with Apollo, who is the um, the god who is carrying um, or like carrying or pulling out the sun every day and pulling it back every night um, across the sky. And she can see him because she's uh, a kind of mermaid, mermaid you sing. And she falls in love with him and he's not loving her back um, and decide that, so she becomes extremely sad. Things happen, bad story. Uh, she's transformed into a sunflower that is ended up being turning up her, ran, her head around him, to see him every day and then falling asleep every day. So quite a sad story. It's a love, yeah, really love, love story about the sunflower. So it's full of meaning. There's something about it in everywhere. Um, part four is the spiral and petroglyphs. The final part, yeah? It's the final part. <laughs> um, da -da -da. I spoke earlier about the marking of the sun and uh, the winter and summer solstice and the spring and the fall equinox and the lunar cycle. So it's a lot of marking and it's a lot of meanings as well. And this is an example of this amazing place called the Sun Dagger that you can uh, go visit and admire the precision of the marking and how it exactly says where things, what things you, know, you can see on the drawing summer, spring, and fall, winter sun. Um, so it's pretty accurate. It's not just a spiral on a, on a rock. Um, so looking at lots and lots of spirals, I came across this stone called the uh, Kokno stone. And uh, this slide is really when everything came together for me graphically. And it's, so it's showing photographs of this stone in um, West Dumbartonshire in Scotland. And it's dating from the Bronze Age. It's measuring 12.8 by 7.9 meters, so it's really big. And it's actually buried so underground. So they unbury it, take pictures, and then open it for visits. And then people started graffiti, putting graffiti on it, so they just covered it back. So you cannot just visit it. There's only pictures of it on the internet or documentaries. Um, so what's very specific is that the whole stone is carved with spirals, cycle, cycle, sorry, cycles and lines, which are called petroglyphs. A petroglyph is an image carved in stone often asso associated with prehistoric era. Uh, they can be found all over the world and in this instance in Scotland. So this particular stone is very, um, it's very special to me and it's because it's been interpreted as a map of the sky and it's a tentative to record and explain the movement of the sun and the solstice. So they're not just doodly graphics, um, circle and spiral, but they're more annotation and translations of the movement of the sun, which are really related to Francesca's journal. Um, so this is all of the collection of um, spiral drawings and um, kind of sketches that I've collected to build a sort of alphabet uh, to be able to also fill her journal. So the idea of the idea came that I will try and give a spiral for each um, poems. So they also became a bit like doodles and graffiti, and they became a kind of disruptive mark on her words. Um, Charlotte's research into petroglyphs also um, that were geometrically proximate to her being in London, because that Cockney stone is in Scotland. Um, it heightened my awareness to uh, petroglyphs that are in Oregon, 
and um, I have a friend who works uh, in, in the environmental field and he made me aware of this book that has all like documents all the sites for where petroglyphs are all over Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the chance to visit some of them. So just this idea of the, of the petroglyph and the symbols and the symbolic language in petroglyphs became a big theme for both Charlotte and I and appear all over the book. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this uh, coming back to Atel Adnan. Um, so this this book has been kind of covered up in my library and um, for some time, and we rediscovered it at sort of at the end of the creative process, uh, which was exciting just to see how another artist had a kindred mind for um, their integration of sort of asymmetric or in intuitive symbols into a legible text. So I love seeing this after. Sorry, Charlotte, were you going to say something? No, no, I was saying that this came last, and that's why it's here. Yeah. It's very, it was very nice to find um, a publication that we felt connected to at the end of the project. Okay, so. Very beautiful work. <laughs> so our kind of conclusion on this uh, publication is um, the concrete poems that we so yeah we started to think about adding more to the book because Francesca was experimenting with lots of different things and I just saw that everything was actually connected and could be reduced in a way that would be just a sample of her work or like a sample of her experimentation or put in with the book and that will actually make sense and add on to um, the meaning of her journal. So the first add-in was um, what sparked the journal, which is the, the neon light. So yes, this um, is an image of a neon weaving, uh, which was intended to be mailed as a postcard. So when I created the weavings, they were actually exhibited um, in the middle of the winter in, in Portland at National, um, you know, when it was raining and dark and, um, so the intention of them was to spread light and to kind of also during the pandemic, uh, people weren't able to um, go inside the gallery. So we put them in the windows so that uh, when people were on their evening walks or passing by, they, the lights would turn on um, at sunset every day. And so just the idea of spreading light was, was very significant part of the um, project in terms of the, the book itself, but also the exhibition light journal. Um, mm -hmm. And so putting it on a postcard is like further way of being able to, you know, put a stamp on it, mail it to a friend and continue to um, spread light. So that was sort of the intention of why, you know, of course it's an image that relates to the text, but also um, it's, an, it's, an act, it's an act and a uh, way for the reader, viewer reader to engage further in the text and participate in spreading light. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the second um, concrete poem is a bag, a uh, yellow bag with some sunflower in it, which um, are, intended, are intended to be grown. Yeah, so this was, um, so the image on the left is of my garden. So I've grown uh, mammoth sunflowers and harvested the seeds for two summers now. And the practice of uh, harvesting the seeds and then mailing them out and sharing them with uh, neighbors and friends um, has been a, a way for me of spreading, another way of spreading light during the pandemic. Uh, so the, the sunflowers shift, uh, as Charlotte said before, their face subtly um, as the sun moves through the sky. It's just an incredible thing. Um, and my hope is that readers would plant these seeds and experience the same phenomenon. So. Um, kind of each concrete poem is meant also to be a, a way of engaging with the viewer reader in like a, an, an act. So the postcard, you know, would be mailed by the um, reader and then the um, sunflowers would be planted. So they all kind of involve their concrete poems, but they also involve like an activity. Yeah, and they're all kind of melting into our situation at the time, which was to be indoor, mm -hmm. working on our plants. 
mailing some stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the simple pleasures of being in isolation. Um, the third complete poem is a turmeric piece, is a piece of canvas, sorry, dyed in turmeric, um, which Francesca started to do very actively during lockdown. Yeah, well. um, I, I have been um, dying or doing natural dyeing since um, my studies since college, but um, this uh, particular idea felt like it was important for the book. Um, the yellow col color of the turmeric cloth is really striking, um, striking yellow, which symbolizes the sun. And it also fades with UV exposure because it's natural dye, so it, there's no chemicals. Um, so it's another interactive concrete poem. Like if you were to put this outside and then put an object on top of it, you would see um, mm -hmm. the shift in light. Um, and it also has a beautiful history. So dyeing um, with turmeric is an ancient craft with roots in Buddhism. And some of the first Buddhist monks made their first made their robes out of what was called pure cloth, um, and they dyed the. Um, they would take waste fabric, so fabric that was soiled or discarded, and then dye it with vegetable matter, including turmeric. So um, the Theravada monks of Southeast Asia still wear these spice-colored robes. I remember when I was living in New York, seeing um, you know monks on the street wearing these robes. They're really beautiful. So that's sort of the symbolic importance behind them. That's it for this slide, Charlotte. Oh no, Charlotte, did you just freeze? Uh oh. Charlotte froze for a second. Hi, you're on speakerphone. Yeah, just wait a second. My laptop just uh, stopped. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to share a screen? Yes. Okay. We only have a few, a few, two slides left. <laughs> okay, I'm saying phone. Okay. One moment. Um, like I'm the video. Uh, wait, hang on, Charlotte. I'm gonna um hang up because I'm gonna share over oh video request. Hang on. Sorry, everyone. Technical difficulties. Okay, hi. Um <laughs> sorry, Charlotte, that's terrible. We were doing so well. Sorry. I know. That's okay. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna share just the last slide. We have only had two slides left. Then we can go to Q and A. Um, so here's Charlotte. <laughs> this is not um, atypical, I think, of our experience collaborating. So this <laughs> makes perfect sense. Okay, can everyone see the screen? I hope so. Oh, yes, the two last slides. That's good. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so the glow in the dark stars. Um, so working with LED and, and neon um, and then the turmeric, which fades in the sun, um, I was thinking very much about how light can exist in an object and how it can be made concrete. So another interactive element was these glow in the dark stars, which were included in the book as a concrete poem. Um, and they're sort of a nostalgic thing that we're most, most of us are familiar with. Um, but the glow in the dark stars contain phosphors, which is a material that can radiate light after absorbing energy from the sun. So it felt like an, another way to um, concretize light uh, as a concrete poem. And then the last slide um, is this uh, UV, just explaining the significance of the UV cover that the entire contents of the book go in. So uh, we wanted to kind of encapsulate everything in a meaningful way. And this UV proof, it's silver, so it sort of reflects light, which is beautiful too, but uh, it also protects all the contents inside from being exposed to light. Uh, so that, that is our conclusion. Um, and I can stop sharing. Oh, oh, she's back. back. And we can take uh, any please. any questions now. If anyone has any questions, you can put it in the Q or Q and A or in the chat. Wait, let me reconnect. Oh, goodness. And thank thank you all so much for um for coming. There she is. Hey, they're gonna stop the button. Give a few minutes. We also wanted to share that we're we're happy to share this PDF. There's so much I think um, 
you know, <laughs> hi, <laughs> there, there's so much, uh, you know, links in there and books that um, there's just a really robust bibliography to this project. So um, that's not necessarily included in the book itself. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out to Charlotte and I or Printed Matter and we can share the PDF. Um, someone said something wonderful to see fame work in light plus art. For the spiral petroglyph, curious why they are all counterclockwise and title for the Portland petroglyph book. Oh okay. yeah. And, I can and, share the I can share the portrait the Portland petroglyph book. It's um, pic pictographs and petroglyphs of the Oregon country. And it's a PD, big PDF, so I'm happy to send it. If you send me an email, I can send you the PDF. I think it's a, a, out of print. Charlotte, do you know why they're um, counterclockwise? They're not, they're not counterclockwise necessarily. Maybe. Like they're all kind of weird shapes. Like that's the thing that came out of this research of like, oh, I was showing lots of slides of like different stones with different spirals. Um, some of them are just kind of doodles. They're not necessarily a perfectly beautifully made spiral. Some of them are just marking like a kind of obsessive gesture. Like you would just say, oh my God, light and then and then that would that would make you come back maybe the next year and that's how I mean some uh, some of the places that I've used to reference um the spiral and the petroglyph are very like their major like the coconut stone or um the the places in New Mexico but most of them are just you know in a corner of um a stone in a random place and they're not yeah they're not precise necessarily they're just yeah, markings um, i don't know how to answer this question matthew s says um do you think we're losing our collection to light and each other in the modern world wait i hope I not do you think we are all losing our connection to light and each other where well, i felt like you know because we at this very specific time to go out like for example in London we had an hour out for a while and that really became like oh my god we have an hour this hour is so precious and we need light this is <laughs> this is the hour for 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 you know my skin my tan my vitamin d my and it just became like why would you go out for this hour in the night you need to go out in the sun and we just yeah felt that very important it was very important for us so i don't know yeah i, like we felt, very, I felt very connected to getting getting a bit of light I, I think it's totally been really um a savior during um during the pandemic and being able to go out or like needing to go outside to experience it um, maybe when in his in his question he's writing about the modern world and it's true that when you see i mean the part that the part of our, our research about architecture you can see and there is this um, documentary that we spoke about um called about this, the the city of new york and the light and the fact that skyscraper are blocking light Mm. There is this idea that, you know, very capitalist idea that the sky doesn't belong to anyone, that you can rise and rise and block the view and it doesn't matter and you shouldn't be paying for it. Um, yeah, this is something that is definitely very negative and belongs to our day and age. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I also think we're connected more to the light that we see on our devices versus seeing one another. I mean, I have not, I've seen so few people in person um, since the beginning of last March. <clears throat> so perhaps uh, in the pandemic world, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I do think I that's. Mean, also, everyone is buying sunscreen for their face to protect from the light of the laptop. <laughs> really? I've not heard that. Yeah, it's called blue light. Oh my god. Um, um, anywho, well, I think now, now we're at 10 minutes after the hour. And um, I guess uh, we had one more question about 
art, uh, female artists who are working with light and art. I guess we had Suzanne Tick. Um, we also had Atel Adnan and um, we also had Agnes Martin, Helma F. Clint. Uh, in terms of artists working with like neon or LED, I'm not sure, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a ton from the research that I've done. But yeah, I think with that, we can, we can probably wrap up. Oh, there's some, yeah, uh, if you know of any artists, share them in the chat. Thank you. Um, I'm saving those artists to go look at. So I think, uh, Margaret, maybe we can, we can just thank everyone and wrap up. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Oh, I'll turn my video back on. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming. And um, we'll have this recording up on our YouTube uh, channel soon. We can share the link with anyone who reaches out. And um, thank you, Francesca and Charlotte. Oh, and I'll drop the link for the book too, just in case anyone wants to purchase it. So yeah, thanks everyone. Okay. Have a nice Thanks. day. Have a nice Bye. evening. Have a nice yeah. evening, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.